Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today, I'm going to be reacting to the US turns away from the world to prohibition and crime between two wars, 1921, part one of two by Time Ghost History. If you want to check out my previous reactions to between two wars, remember the playlist card will be at the top. Just click on it and you'll be able to access them. All right, let's start. Three, two, one. Go. The 20th century has been called by many the American century. The U.S. was on the victorious side in the world wars, was at the forefront of the opposition to the Soviet bloc and its attempts to expand communism during the Cold War, and was the global leader of technological innovation and human development. For much of the 20th century, it was the world's most prosperous nation with the highest standard of living, and it set a cultural and economic standard that the world population, even in enemy territories, aspired to emulate. Yes, the U.S. sometimes resorted to the undemocratic and inhumane methods of its enemies, and there were huge ethnic struggles and social and economic inequalities. But by many positive measures, it was the world leader. But now in 1921, popular sentiment and the U.S. political forces that oppose the progressive movement are in the process of halting the march toward global leadership at a crucial moment in world history. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a summary of the interwar years from the uncertainty and hedonism of the 1920s to humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. The United States of America had been founded on the idea of creating an independent nation apart from the social, economic, and military problems of the colonial powers from which it had originated. Although a nation of immigrants and settlers, the U.S. had, until 1865, focused on self-sufficiency and extreme liberalism verging on libertarianism. It traded with the world at arm's length and practiced economic policies of protectionism and isolationism. With the American Civil War and the industrialization of the northern states... How many nations nowadays can say that uh, something like that, you know, being isolationists being self-sustaining, uh, being extremely liberal in their ethos and government structures, you know, how many nations currently in the world can actually do that? We're so globalized that, you know, something that happens there will affect us here. And yeah, in those times, people had it good with nation building it appears but nowadays you, you can't do that we're all in this together as they say you know we're all one global village so nations that believe that they can self-sustain themselves you know with their own resources and uh, people and uh, technology they won't last they won't last the globalization or the the force of globalization will compel them to join the group you know yeah so it's interesting this starts to change under president abraham lincoln and his successors this rather sprawling progressive era will end with president woodrow wilson now the progressive era was a period of reform resulting generally in better minority rights better social care and the end of the deeply corrupt american mercantile system but let's be clear here the u.s progressive era has nothing to do with left or right-wing politics you have to consider that the u.s at this time is at the forefront of classical liberalism within both the republican and the democratic parties and today's classification of republicans and democrats on the right or the left does not apply in fact it is the republican party under lincoln that begins the era but it is soon adopted as a core philosophy by both parties in any case Progressivism picked up speed in the early 1900s under Republican presidents Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, and they began to drop the 19th century state of isolationism. The idea was to bring the U.S. into the budding global community of nations. Roosevelt had expanded U.S. influence in South America while laying a foundation for increased global trade with the construction of the Panama Canal. On the domestic front, Roosevelt's, Taft's, and Wilson's policies brought more equal opportunity and prosperity and fit right into the ideals that would later be called living the american dream much of this was supported 
or at least accepted, by the majority of the American people. But there was little public desire for U.S. involvement in foreign issues and conflicts. In fact, Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, had won re-election in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of the war. So with the U.S. entry into the World War in April 1917, there was outrage throughout the nation. By the end of the war, with over 100,000 American lives lost and twice that wounded, the public had had enough. The Republicans seized on the popular sentiment of dissatisfaction, and in the midterm elections of 1918, the Democrats lost their majority in Congress and even saw their significant majority in the Senate shift to a solid Republican advantage. Wilson now faces an uphill battle to secure ratification for the peace plans proposed in his 14 points and the creation of a League of Nations for which he is fighting during the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. The Republicans, led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, strongly oppose many parts of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, especially the mandate of the League to make war in the name of all members if someone breaks the covenant of the League. Wilson refuses to compromise, but it looks like he might get the votes he needs in the Senate anyway. However, in September 1919, he collapses from exhaustion. The next month, he suffers a series of strokes that leaves him seriously disabled. In November, his supporters fail to secure the two-thirds majority for ratification, and the U.S. walks away from the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, a significant blow to Wilson's peace plan that will have massive ramifications and contribute to the conflicts that lead to the outbreak of World War II 20 years later. But foreign policy is only the tip of the iceberg of problems now facing the ailing president. The post-war economy is suffering. There is a growing feeling of despair as the country heads toward a sharp deflationary recession and race and labor riots have sprung up all over America. The economic downturn is largely due to the end of a war economy, with hundreds of thousands of soldiers coming home and looking for jobs that are no longer there. This will eventually turn around into economic prosperity and the Roaring Twenties when the Allies start paying back their war debts. But in 1920-1921, this seems far away. So. As the U.S. heads into the 1920 elections, the country is in turmoil. Wilson is not only losing popularity, but his health prevents him from running for a third presidential term. Back then, you could do that, actually. Instead, the Democratic candidate is the relatively un- Wait, so you guys can't do that now? Like, for instance, for example, if Trump wanted to be president again for the second time, or is it third time now? I think, no, he's only been voted in once. He hasn't been re-elected yeah he hasn't been re-elected so yes if trump can be re-elected uh in the next general elections uh that will be his second time right so can he come back for a third time if it were possible or is that law now changed in america and you know you can only have a president to serve two terms in office and then it's over that would be interesting though Imagine Trump being president two more times. <laughs> well, the world is already crazy, so, you know, I think it would be fine if he was president again. You know, you'll make us laugh, you know, because nowadays politics, global politics is not, it's not funny anymore. It's very, whew, it's very stressful. Yeah. Own Governor James M. Cox, whose running mate is Franklin D. Roosevelt. The opposing Republican nominee, Senator Warren G. Harding, crushes Cox in a landslide, winning the largest popular vote margin in a century. But before Harding officially takes office on March 4th, 1921, President Wilson presides over two major amendments to the U.S. Constitution. On August 26, the 19th Amendment is passed, granting women the right to vote. You can learn more about that in our video, Sex, Drugs, and the Right to Vote. The other amendment overseen by the Wilson administration is the 18th Amendment. This will famously be known as Prohibition. In 1919, the idea of banning the production, distribution, and sale of alcohol is considered a progressive idea that has been brewing throughout the progressive era. The temperance movements had been around for over a hundred years in the States. Alcoholism was in fact rampant all over the Western world and exacerbated things like poverty, domestic abuse, and crime in general. In 1830, 
The average American drank three times as much alcohol as in 2010, though women tended to drink far less than men. Christian activists labeled drinking as immoral and unchristian. The temperance movement also became closely associated with women's suffrage, as many of the activists were women. By 1900, though, it was still a state issue, with Kansas being the first to abolish alcohol in 1881. It was during the World War that the idea of a nationwide ban on alcohol became popular with progressive politicians. Taxi um, yeah, wow. Um, I'm just imagining my country doing that. You know, South Africa just making a prohibition on alcohol. There would be chaos. There would be civil war, I think. I mean, the way people love this um liquid substance it's amazing you know it's either they're partying with it or they are going to a funeral or a um a wedding or just normal saturday or sunday watching sports you know drinking a couple of beers and uh, other forms of liquor uh, i mean i can just imagine i can just imagine the kind of chaos that would occur if all of that just went away or was uh, deemed illegal. Wow, it would be chaos. Taxes on alcohol were increased, and by 1917, a majority of both Republicans and Democrats were dries, as prohibitionists were popularly called. An unexpected effect of the war was that it sidelined the power base of German Americans who had been strongly anti-prohibition, as many of them were linked to the brewing industry. A majority of Americans and President Wilson personally are actually opposed to prohibition, despite both parties in Congress supporting it by broad majorities. By 1919, prohibition had been enacted as state law in 36 of the 48 states, and on the 28th of October 1919, the 18th Amendment passed. Wilson actually vetoed the amendment, but the Senate overrode him. On January 16, 1920, it goes into effect. What followed, though, was not a more moral and stable society. Instead, it was an unprecedented wave of crime. As Wilson and other wets had predicted, the total ban of alcohol distribution in a country where most adults are alcoholics is not something you do without encountering major problems. As soon as the news of the 18th Amendment reaches the public, people begin stockpiling like crazy, filling basements, storerooms, and warehouses with liquor. Even Wilson fills up his Washington mansion with liquor. In 1921, when Harding, who voted for the amendment, takes office, he'll move a huge supply of all kinds of booze into the White House. The implementation of the law is also badly planned. For instance, alcohol has medicinal value, but suddenly doctors cannot use it. And when the law is amended so that physicians can sell medicinal alcohol, many start selling it illegally at a high profit. And there are plenty of customers, especially once those stockpiles run dry. People living in the border states can get liquor in Mexico. Or so people were drinking medical approved alcohol I, I'm assuming that you're not actually supposed to drink that, you know, it's meant for medical purposes and probably it's much more, what's the word I'm looking, maybe potent, you know, for infectious diseases or, or wounds or, you know, some sort of problem that you might have with your body and you need alcohol to disinfect whatever is occurring on your body and now you're drinking that. Canada, but for the most part, people have to find other avenues of access. To satisfy that demand come the bootleggers. Bootlegging begins as smuggling from Mexico and Canada. But as border controls tighten, many bootleggers start working at sea. Off the coast of Atlantic City, foreign ships dump crates of alcohol into speedboats fast enough to outrun the Coast Guard. Running these complex operations is organized syndicate crime. Thus. The birth of prohibition is also the birth of something else, the American Mafia. Okay, in New York, gambling and loan king Arnold Rothstein was already running his criminal organization as a serious business in the teens, and he will briefly foray into bootlegging, though in the 20s, his focus will shift to becoming America's and the world's drug kingpin before his murder in 1928. By then, his empire's ranks will include such familiar names as Dutch Schultz, Lucky Luciano, Legs Diamond, and Meyer Lansky. 
but the most famous gangster of all, to us in 2018, was Al Capone, who in 1920 was still Alphonse Gabriel and working as a bouncer in a Chicago brothel. Capone's boss, Big Jim Colomiso, is murdered in May and Johnny Torrio takes over, making Capone his second in command. Torrio and Capone get into bootlegging big time, selling to the whole south side of Chicago. With the profits, they expand into gambling, prostitution, racketeering, extortion, and new fields like narcotics. In 1924, Capone will ambush and murder his and Torrio's rival, Dean O'Banion, the crime boss and leader of the mainly Irish north side gang, thus consolidating power over all of Chicago and putting Capone on track to be the most powerful crime boss in America. But for now, that's in the future. In 1921, Al Capone's story is, is nothing out of the ordinary. Organized crime literally explodes throughout the states when the distribution of illegal liquor becomes increasingly complex. It's the most lucrative criminal activity in the country, and before long, people start making booze within the borders again. Denatured alcohol used by various industries is washed for toxic chemicals and mixed with regular water and sold by small crime rings to unknowing buyers. Thousands of bargain drinkers become paralyzed, blind, or even die. These small crime rings merge to create larger operations and it creates an entire dark economy value chain from farmers selling wheat to underground breweries and backroom distilleries and finally the illegal bars and nightclubs which become known as speakeasies who pay top dollar for the product. To protect their operations, the gangs fight the police and each other in the streets and alleys of America, and the gangsters become household names. America has again become the land of opportunity, but criminal opportunity, and as so often happens, the fish stinks from the head. President Harding will die of a heart attack in office in 1923, and it will be revealed that here in 1921, he's one of the most corrupt citizens of them all. During the Teapot Dome scandal, he and Secretary of the Interior Albert B. Fall set up a lease program to give naval oil reserves at low rates to private oil companies for which those companies paid the two a fortune. A fortune Harding uses to live the early roaring 20s like a gangster boss. He organizes high stakes poker games in the White House. He he entertains numerous mistresses, and he drinks away at his stockpile of booze, turning 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue into the most glorious speakeasy of them all. But he does more than that. Harding ran on a ticket of return to normalcy, which to the people meant that America should focus on itself. So he enacts heavy isolationist and protectionist policies that make America turn its back on a world that is left to Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, Tojo, and the like to define. Although he continues progressive measures to give, for example, black Americans more rights, and he is not personally opposed to immigration, there is widespread fear of new arrivals from Eastern Europe that might infect America with communism. So under popular pressure, he restricts immigration, especially from Eastern Europe. Many of these Eastern Europeans are Jews who must now remain in Europe and continue to suffer oppression and persecution. Together with his Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, Harding does a lot to promote business. He actively promotes the development of new technology. He cuts taxes above levels recommended by his economists. And in an effort to, I guess, free the American economy, abolishes the regulations of businesses and the financial sector put in place by his predecessors. The market will in fact boom as taxes go down and fresh money flows back into the country with the repayment of allied war debts. This president sounds like Trump, but far more successful in what he wanted to do. It's quite interesting. Um, all his policies and the foreign policy that he also projected is quite similar to what Trump was trying to do. Um, but in terms of, you know, immigrants coming into America back then, they were worried about Eastern Europeans. Uh, and in our present day, uh, for example, President Trump was worried about uh, people coming from countries that had extremists and, you know, terrorists and everything like that. And he also wanted to reduce the tax uh, for businesses and for households so that businesses could also have more, you know, money and capital to continue growing their, 
their investments and whatever else they had. And he also wanted to deregulate the business sector as well, you know. So this president, <laughs> he achieved everything Trump wanted to do. But Trump had his own, like he was everywhere. He was touching everything at once, you know. He was, he was a funny guy, yeah. But unchecked and unregulated financial markets will eventually inflate into a gigantic bubble that will burst in 1929 wreaking havoc on the entire planet's economy. But the financial rush Hoover's and Harding's policies begin to unleash on the country creates so much short-term prosperity that despite the Teapot Dome scandal being actively investigated and Harding already shortly after his death being labeled the worst president in US history, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, has no problem winning the presidential election of 1924. The worst president in history. They don't know anything. <laughs> Coolidge keeps Hoover at his post and largely pursues the same policies as Harding. But nearly 10 years from now, then President Hoover will be overwhelmed by the Great Depression. But already before that hits, all the programs that Wilson had hoped would stop a resurgence of militarism will begin to fail. Now that the U.S. has turned its back on the world and refused to join the peace effort, the League of Nations is weakened to the point of being meaningless, thus useless in checking the upcoming rise of militarism in Germany and Japan and renewed plans of the Soviets to violently expand their communist empire. Events that are driven by extremists increasing their power on the heels of a financial collapse created by wild speculation on financial markets that have been unleashed and left unchecked by the world's governments. The price for a warm feeling emanating from the burning hot furnace of short-term financial growth behind the closed doors of Uncle Harding's cabin in the 1920s will be counted in American lives starting December 7, 1941. To get our episodes ahead of time and support the effort to make more content like, like this, Join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon or directly on our timeghost.tv website. There, you can also sign up for our forum for free. Links are in the description. Now, if you missed our episode, Sex, Drugs, and the Right to Vote, it's right here. And if you haven't already, subscribe to Time Ghost and World War II on YouTube. World War II week by week starts September 1st, 2018. See you next time. Cheers to temperance. Yes, guys, that's the U.S. turns away from the world to prohibition and crime between two wars, 1921, part one of two. Um, I, I see some similarities, you know. Uh, yes, it's not exactly the same, but there are telltale signs of something that has happened before. It is happening again, but in a different version, a different uh, th under a different theme and, and uh, under different words, you know, um, and it's quite interesting, really. And I also have to admit that it was very brave or very stupid of the American government uh, to uh, make a prohibition on alcohol. I mean, like I said before, in, if that was done in my country, there would be chaos they would be chaos there's just something that this drug has a hold on humanity it has a hold on us for some reason um it's alcohol it's uh cigarettes um what else maybe even marijuana and all other forms of uh substances that you know leave you feeling happy and uh in a very happy state you know you're trying to escape your reality of your own pain through these uh, drugs that, that that we take so you know it's a very powerful um, substance that you can't just wave away with a law with a piece of document and say that it's become law that this thing is um, illegal and you can't sell it you can't trade it uh, you can't uh, consume it because people will find a way they will find a way wherever there's a gap in the market they will fill it up and that's what happened and that's how uh, crime started to become even more prominent 
and more bloody uh, chaos was running through the streets of Chicago and wherever else in America and really I mean for example in my country during the COVID crisis right um, our government started to ban cigarettes and the moment that happened right uh, the black market uh, for cigarettes started to grow exponentially they grew so fast and so strong that the tax that we get from uh, 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 from the cigarette companies has been completely uh, demolished you know because now people are no longer buying the the brands that they buy from uh, the stores or from supermarkets or what, whatever else uh, whatever else they buy the cigarettes from they're now buying it on the streets they're buying it from people in dodgy areas and they that all that money that was meant to go to the state is now going to these criminal organizations that run these uh, black market cigarette uh, uh, supply chain so really you can't really prohibit these drugs you can only find a way to direct them to control them into a path that would be um, an advantage to the state you know to get more revenue more tax revenue from the alcoholic sector from the cigarette sector and from uh, uh, the marijuana sector you know don't try to block them because the moment you do you create a gap in the market criminals take over and it becomes chaos it becomes chaos so yeah this was quite interesting um guys if you like the video give me a like comment and subscribe to my channel click on the notification bell if you need to be up to date with my latest videos and i will see you next time okay bye, -bye.